Hi there, friends. Welcome to Tradition. I'm Jeff Kassman, and this is a series of interviews and discussions that I'm having with my friend Jim DePiante on all sorts of things related to tradition. Jim, welcome uh, once again. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. So folks, what we're doing here is we're talking about common questions, frequently asked questions that come up uh, among people who are new to tradition, new to attending the traditional Latin mass and all of the things related to traditional Catholicism, the things that our, our parents and grandparents and well, frankly, our ancestors for many hundreds of years, thousands of years in some cases, have done that were largely lost over the last few decades. And uh, many of us are coming to know them for the first time. So if you have just started attending the, the mass and you've got questions about what's going on and why the priest does the things that he does or why people do the things that they do, you're in the right place. Or maybe you've been coming to the mass for some time and you've always had little questions. You didn't know who to ask or you were afraid or embarrassed to ask them. We're tackling those questions here. So uh, I encourage you, if you have not been watching previous episodes, to go back and take a look at some of those things that we've talked about. We've covered things in, in depth. For example, the, the gestures and the postures uh, that Catholics use at mass and the various levels of solemnity of the different masses and the fasting and abstinence practices that Catholics engage in. Uh, the liturgical year and the current season of Paschal Tide. These are all things that we've covered in previous episodes. Now, in today's episode, we're going to look at something rather controversial. If you're involved in any way uh, in the community or online, if you've come from a, a largely Novus Ordo practice on your background, you have heard about a, a rather controversial devotion. And it, it's very popular among those uh, who are coming to tradition. Uh, and yet a, a lot of people within tradition have problems with this or reject it altogether or even use some rather harsh terms. And so uh, what I'm talking about, you've probably guessed it, is the divine mercy devotion, that, uh, that great devotion that uh, John Paul II placed on this last Sunday, what normally would be called low Sunday among traditional Catholics. Uh, so that having been said, Jim, Start from the beginning. What is this thing called the divine mercy? Well, it's, um, it's actually a complex of several interrelated elements, <clears throat> more than a devotion. It's almost, it's almost like a phenomenon, a, a, a sensation, if you will. And I've observed and I've been around the, the divine mercy devotion practically my entire life. Um, there's a fair amount of almost fanatical attachment to it. But I'll say it's problematic on, uh, on many levels. And uh, I, I agree with you. I, I've, I've told everyone, I think, uh, I grew up in the Novus Ordo. I was, uh, I was 25 before I went to my first traditional Latin mass. Didn't even know that there was such a thing. And this, this was a big deal. I mean, anybody who grew up in the, the JP2 era this was kind of the pinnacle of, of devotions. Of spirituality, uh, right. Yeah, and uh, unless you went to Medjugorje, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to cover, cover that another time. We were showing uh, that, too. All right, sorry about that. All right, so tell me, uh, let's, let's get back on the topic. What are the interrelated elements that you're talking about that make this kind of complex? So at the center of it all is this 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 individual baptized Helena Kowalska, uh, eventually known as Sister Faustina. And within her orbit, there are, there are various things, supposed apparitions, a diary supposedly recounting these apparitions, an image which she is said to have commissioned, a chaplet, a novena, a supposed feast day, and even a particular hour of the day and what I'm going to say is a very problematic name. Hey, let's start with that. It, it's referred to as the divine mercy. That, that sounds pretty good. That sounds wonderful. Like we all, we all would want mercy. Well, well, we all want some of that. It, yeah, it, it, it is wonderful. Exactly. It's too wonderful. So when Catholics refer to the divine mercy, this should be a reference only to mean mercy as an attribute of God. This is 
the divine mercy. The Sister Faustina phenomenon is not the divine mercy. It's a devotion focused, overly focused, I would say, on the divine mercy. But unfortunately, we confound these two. Uh, confusion does seem to be kind of the prime characteristic of our of our current generation, does it not? Um, this this complex of devotions, this phenomenon, as as you have referred to it, why can it not just be understood as simply a devotion to one of the attributes of God, that of His mercy? Now, God, of course, is is a simple being but he's the combination of all of his attributes. Justice forms the basis of our relationship with God. Justice forms the basis of our relationship with everyone. The idea of God's mercy is only meaningful in the context of his justice. We're entitled to that mercy if we satisfy his justice. And that means first and foremost, repentance on our part. Following the devotion supposedly is that is all we have to do to avail ourselves of, of God's mercy. There's nothing in the devotion that speaks explicitly to the need to turn away from sin and to repent. So all of, all of these uh, alleged apparitions are recounted in her diary. Uh, the diary itself, it seems to me, uh, receives more criticism than the the chaplet than even her life it, it's 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 widely criticized severely so why well two reasons a lot of what is said a lot of it is just banality but some of it is weird and some of it's downright heterodox i mean it's it's just smacks of heresy and some of it is weird and heterodox so i mean just Let's talk about some examples. One of the first things that Faustina records is when she was 18. So this was 1924, seven years after Fatima, okay? Um, she claims to have had an apparition of the suffering Jesus and that he said to her, how long shall I put up with you and how long will you keep putting me off? Is this the very same Jesus who said in scripture, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart? That's, that's, that's not something that we would have expected this, this, our Lord in his meekness to ever say. Soon after Faustina entered the convent, um, she recounts that while she was praying before the blessed sacrament, a host came out of the tabernacle and, and she says, came to rest in my hands. And this was repeated a second time, and it happened a third time. So that's one incident. In a different incident, she claims, when the priest approached me, I raised the host for him to put back into the chalice. But while I was holding the host in my hand, I heard these words from the host. I desired to rest in your hands, not only in your heart. Yeah, that, that's, that's just bizarre. I mean, yeah. I, I, this is what 30 30 40 years before communion in the hand was introduced as as some sort of attempted i don't know placating people who maybe they thought that would bring protestants in the church or something i, I don't know trying to trying to see these things to the best possible light it, that's that's just bizarre it seems it seems like this is an attempt to give a divine endorsement of communion in the hand, which raises some doctrinal problems, doesn't it? It, it does, and there are more. Um, one in particular, uh, uh, Faustina claims that Jesus said to her, from now on, do not fear God's judgment, for you will not be judged. I mean, when you hear those words, you should immediately think, this is craziness. This is rank heresy. It's a frank denial of the particular and the general judgments. Look, the Apostles' Creed has exactly 12 articles of faith, and this is one of them. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. But every person who is subject to original sin will be judged. Every human creature will be judged, except Faustina. 
Yeah, th this is I mean, this is deeply problematic, right? The individual judgment is, is I mean, that's that's something so central to our faith that at the moment of our death, we are judged. And, and there's there's a lot around that that dogma. We don't I don't think we need to go into it, but that's it's not even questionable. You can't doubt it. You can't challenge it. You can't think that that doesn't no, it's, happen. It's de fide all the way. And and that it's our our Lord, the second person of the Trinity became man and, and suffered and died and rose from the dead. He's the one there at that that judgment. Um, it's that's really challenging to me aside from all the other things that you know people oftentimes have heard about that that's a real it's a real problem it seems to me that if this was the only thing you knew about the whole phenomenon that you would be justified in saying okay i've heard enough and and just just walk away. jettison this just jettison it completely <laughs> well yeah but like i said um there are things that are heterodox and there are things that are weird this one even if you don't understand the heterodoxy of the thing, uh, Faustina claims that Jesus said to her, you are a sweet grape and a chosen cluster. I want others to have a share in the juice that is flowing within you. I, 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 I remarked to a, a person about this one time. He said, well, yeah, but that's how the mystics talk. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. Aunt Catherine Emmerich didn't talk like that. John of the Cross never talked like that. I promise you. So if you're not put off by the doctrinal issues, the weirdness of it should make you, make you run for the exits. Another doctrinal problem. Jesus supposedly says, and know this too, my daughter, all creatures, whether they know it or not, and whether they want to or not, always fulfill my will. I got news for you, Faustina. This morning, there was this little incident I'm going to take to the confessional where I did not fill God's will. Okay. No, that's totally wrong. This is a repudiation of the single most important dogma regarding the creation of man, that he is endowed with a free will. And we save our souls. By doing God's will. If all men, whether they want to or not, do God's will, then all men save their souls. How can that be? Yeah, that, that seems clearly opposed to the faith. I mean, does not, does not scripture say all men have sinned, which means... The just what? man sins seven times a day. Right. And every sin is a repudiation of God's will. Yeah. And, and have not many popes and doctors taught about the fewness of the saved? Well, it's in, in scripture itself, it says many are called, few are chosen. Um, uh, narrow, narrow is the gate, uh, wide is the path that leads to perdition. Uh, many, many saints have said that, uh, that yeah, the number, the number of the saved is few. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing... Uh, knowing you and your depth of research that there's probably probably more <laughs> uh, my daughter if you wish i will this instant create a new world more beautiful than this one and you will live there for the rest of your life that's that's weird and heterodox no actually god finished his creation and he's not making a new <laughs> look for our lady our Lord turned water into wine. For Faustina, he's going to create a whole new world. I mean, come on. How can we take this seriously? But that, that is a weird kind of uh, Mormon-esque sort of thing, right? Where, uh, I mean, the Mormons tend to be very nice people. I think we all know that. But, I mean, do, do they not believe that each one of them will get their own new world? To new world. world. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they get their own new world as Jesus got this world, it's kind of that, that sort of thing, uh, as I recall. Um, it's off. It's off. <laughs> uh, is, is she perhaps, you know, the mystics can be weird sometimes, let's just say that, that potentially to regular people, they could appear to be kind of weird. Mm -hmm. is, is it possible that this is some sort of strange anticipation of of the new Jerusalem, that, that you know, the new heavens and new earth that would 
maybe be created after the final judgment for all of the elect to enjoy or something? I, I don't know. I'm trying to find some way to kind of you reason. Really, you, you might be able to, but I think it would take a contortionist to make that fit. Um, well, I mean, wouldn't it be that Jesus wills that? Our Lord wills that. He, he doesn't need Faustina's permission. If that's the case, yeah, I, I, this is this has nothing to do with with what the church has always taught about eschatology, about the end of, of the end of time. There's just it's it's just a complete novelty. So, but this isn't. I mean, for Catholics, we look at Our Lady as as the greatest of all creatures. And we assign her a tremendous place in, in heaven and in our hearts and, and in our devotion. And so the one of the first things that strikes me about all of this is it, it's almost like she's supplanting Our Lady, that these, these might theoretically be things that, you know, if you could listen to the conversation in heaven between our, our Lord and his mother, that maybe he would say, if you wish it, I will do it. But he... He's saying these things to a nun. To a nun in Poland in the twentieth century. Um, yeah. a, a nun who was quite taken with herself. Um, our, our Lord ostensibly said to her, "That is why I am uniting." This is really weird. <laughs> I'm unite. I am uniting myself with you so intimately as with no other creature. Let us be clear: Jesus did not unite himself with us. We unite ourselves with him. No one was more closely united with him than was his holy mother. Yeah, that, that's, that's a real problem. I mean, he if we take these words at face value, he's suggesting that there is some sort of new union with Faustina that even Our Lady did not didn't approach enjoy because because. She was a she was a creature. She was created by by God. He united with her in the most intimate possible way. Shared her very DNA, blood. Literally, literally, li literally, uh, which is a whole other interesting thing about our Lord's blood on the cross and so forth. But not to get too far off, it. I, I think any well formed Catholic would read that and say, and something's theory. something's wrong. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Continue. Okay. So I see your love so pure, more pure than that of the angels and all the more, all the more so because you keep fighting. What the, what is this a Rocky movie? I mean, seriously, you keep fighting pure than the angels. Seriously. Only our lady because of her total humility is to be exalted in any way above the angels. The angels were created as the greatest of God's creations, Our Lady exceeded and is more exalted than the angels because of her, her humility. But, but just the language of it, all the more so because you keep fighting. <laughs> this is not the way that God, man, the Savior speaks. I'm sorry. There's no precedent for this. Yeah, it does. The, the <clears throat> tone is striking and it's... <clears throat> and how disparate it is from what we read of all of our Lord's language and conversation in the gospels, for example, or even in, in other, other apparitions, whether the other, approved, the other, other mystics, absolutely. This is, this is not, the the tone is, is, is so oh. strange. There's, there's a, a continual glorification of, of the human, this, this woman, that, rather than, I don't know, it's just, it seems to be vain. It, well, there, we, we talk about more examples of that. Tell the Superior General to count on you as the most faithful daughter in the order. And this is like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ trying to appeal to a woman's vanity. Then Faustina, after receiving communion, this one, I've, I've, this one scares me. Jesus, transform me into another host. So this is a request she is making of him. Jesus, transform me into another host. You are a great and all-powerful Lord. You can grant me this favor. Well, that's weird enough, but it gets weirder. And the Lord answered me, you are a living host. Faustina now. The real presence. I don't know how else to understand that. 
Yeah, I don't, again, trying to kind of, I, I hate not to say playing the devil's advocate here, but. No, but you want to put the best face on it. I mean. <laughs> and is she somehow trying to say that she wants to share she wants to join our Lord on the cross. She wants to share in his suffering. She wants to offer herself up for, for others. I mean, it, I'm trying to figure out what that means to make me another host, because you wouldn't normally say it that way. You wouldn't refer to yourself as a host. I mean, certainly other saints have talked about wanting to share, you know, in our Lord's pain or, or trying even suffering to even suffering hey, and yeah, or I'd like to take the pain from you, my Lord, let me somehow you know, bear that burden for you, you know, you read those kinds of things, but, but the language here just is odd. It's no, not it's right. Very, it's very odd. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the other thing uh, I've read about that she was very eager for one of her uh, fellow confreres to be named a saint, one of the other women from her congregation of saints. Yeah. Um, so apparently when she was a young sister, there was the canonization of one Saint Andrew Bovola, about whom I know nothing, but he was canonized. And Faustina saw this, uh, he being uh, of, of an order, one, one congregation or another. And she said, my soul was instantly filled with a great longing that our congregation too might have a saint. And I wept like a child that there was no saint in our midst. And I said to the Lord, I know your generosity, and yet it seems to me that you are less generous toward us. But where's, where's the humility in that? And I began to weep like a little child. And the Lord Jesus said to me, do not cry. You are that saint. This is, it's laced with vanity. In the annals of Catholic hagiography, nothing like that has ever been said. This is not the language of a saint. And, and I mean, clearly, we all should want to become a saint, but our motive should be only for the love of God, not for pride in one's congregation. It does seem to be a marked contrast between, uh, for example, what Our Lady said to those children at, at Fatima, right? She, didn't she say to the, to the little, or about the little boy, yeah, he'll make it to heaven, but he's got to go eventually. To, eventually. eventually, at the end of time, right? Right, right. Uh, a kid, a kid, a little boy. Yeah, uh, totally. It's off. It's okay, off. so, so how did how did all of this pass muster with with the Holy Office? It didn't. It didn't. When John twenty third was Pope, November nineteen fifty eight, the Holy Office under the great. Cardinal Ottaviani declared that the supernatural nature of the revelations made to Sister Faustina is not evident. So flat out, there's nothing supernatural about this. No feast of the divine mercy is ever to be instituted and it is forbidden to divulge images and writings that propagate this devotion under the form received by Sister Faustina. And if that didn't convince people, then again, in March of 1959, the Holy Office reaffirmed that decision, stating the diffusion of images and writings promoting the devotion to the divine mercy under the form proposed by the same Sister Faustina was forbidden. That's clear. But in, in defense of the diary, did not uh, John Paul II and others say that well, all of these actions by the Holy Office were, were kind of based on a, a false premise because the, the diary that they evaluated had a poor translation or was incorrect or something like that. And so we should kind of disregard those actions when we evaluate this because it was based on a, uh, you know, a, an, an error of fact. Yeah. Well, th there's no question. He said that and others have said it. But I'm going to tell you why I'm not buying it. The idea that we've somehow gotten better at translating in three quarters of a century, it's, it's just silly, but it's generally recognized that translations that are done contemporaneously with the event, with the event are, are going to be superior. So the idea that these translations were inferior in any way to translations done decades later, 
That's, that's not credible. But I want to tell you that what I've just recounted, which is, which is a sampler, I mean, there's so much more that's just Looney Tunes. That's not from bad old translations. This is from the new and improved translations. So no, I'm not buying it. If the errors were due to bad translations, why are they still there? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, so what if we said, okay, she wrote some strange things. The diary is problematic. Let's set that aside for a second. What about the image? Because let's face it, most people have probably not read a single word of this, this diary, but they are very, very familiar with the image. Everybody sees the image. It's, it's everywhere. And, and not just in, in, in you know, uh, progressive modernist parishes. And, On the contrary. On the it, contrary, it's the so-called conservative Catholics who embrace it, who love it. And, and I'm told that, that in, in some places in Europe, even in traditional uh, chapels or traditional le leaning places, that, that it's prominent. That's true. So, so talk about the image, because the image itself has come under a great deal of criticism that you don't find, a, you know, you don't find with the Sacred Heart or the Immaculate Heart or, or Our Lady of Sorrows, to whom I have a special devotion, you know, those images... I, I just have never heard no. doctrinal kinds of challenges, but, but this one has a, has a lot of issues. Well, why do people find it creepy? Well, um, first observation, the image, the classic image of God's mercy is that of the sacred heart. The sacred heart devotion is inherently a devotion of reparation. It's outrageously conspicuous that the divine mercy image has no heart, which is the symbol of, of God's mercy, but also of what he suffered for us because it was the piercing of his heart, which was literally the death knell. But not only, there are no wounds on this image. Thomas Aquinas elucidated five reasons why Christ still in heaven, in his glorified body, still bears his wounds and that they are always shown in every image of our Lord in, in Christian art that is painted of him during his passion, the crucifixion, and subsequently after his resurrection. He's always shown with the wounds. This image, this divine mercy image, is a sacred heart without a heart, a devotion without reparation, and it does not reflect the price of our sins. This is not clearly evident. Whatever, whatever criticism we might have, that we might have, the image itself was condemned explicitly by the Holy Office. I mean, how do you explain that as being due to bad translations? The Polish bishops at the time rejected it, criticized it, condemned it, because <laughs> the image that we all see, that's not the original image. The original image had... The, the rays coming from where the heart is not were two, red and white, and conspicuously resembling the Polish flag. And the Polish bishop said, what is this? Um, I should point out that the contemporary version is criticized because of its resemblance of the red, white, and blue rays that are on the Masonic French flag. It, it really is pretty extraordinary. I, until we started planning for this episode, I had not paid much attention to this image, but it is extraordinary the difference between the original and, and what I guess is probably the more popular version, yeah. what we, version number two or, or um, and, and you're right, there are no wounds and all these, the, the rays are coming from where the, the heart would have been. Um, okay, so now that we're talking about the image itself, who, who is the artist? What do we know about the artist who, who painted this? He was, he was a Pole, supposedly commissioned directly by Faustina Eugeniusz Kazimierowski. Interesting fact about him. He was a Freemason. 
He did other paintings, of course. This is not the only painting he did. He was reasonably well known. Um, he did a painting in which he portrayed himself as Judas. Um, sadly, he, like Judas, um, Eugenius actually committed suicide. When you, when you speak of these things to people who are attached to this devotion, it's amazing the, the lengths they will go to to try to explain these things away. These things are germane. They're meaningful. I would imagine the defenders of the devotion would say, well, wait a second, Jim, you know, uh, the church has many great, wonderful works of art, and they were all painted by sinners, and some of them were not, maybe not even practicing Catholics. Uh, they would probably go to the Sistine Chapel and point around and say, well, you know, he allegedly was this and that. How would you respond to that? Okay, so, I mean, frankly, it's pretty shocking. <laughs> he was a Freemason, and he painted himself as Judas, but how would you respond to that defense that well, that doesn't really mean anything about the essence of what the painting is, is trying to show. Well, I would say two things, Jeff. The first is every single artist in the history of the world is a sinner, has always been a sinner. There are no artists, great and small, who were not sinners. But it's one thing to be a sinner. It's another thing to be a member of an organization that has a dedicated animus against our holy religion. So that's the first thing I would observe. The second thing I would observe is that when you look at the ideals of Freemasonry and consider how much this, this devotion aligns with those ideals, that gives me pause. Now, I thought the Freemasons just wanted to do barbecue and go bowling. And drive the little cars in the parade, right? All right, well, we'll have to, we'll have to get to that. Well, that's another show. <laughs> All right. Um, so it, it, it is kind of, uh, it's, it's odd, for sure. You would expect this devotion would, would bring about conversions in the and the people who were so intimately tied to it, right? Not, not lead them to double down on their lifestyle and, and, and commit suicide as, as a consequence. Um, but let, let's set that aside too. Uh, Sister Faustina uh, was canonized by John Paul II. Can we believe that she is a saint? Must we believe that she is a saint? I mean, this is pretty pretty high action by a pontiff to name someone a saint. Um, I, will, I will make two observations. If the same rigorous criteria were applied to her that were ap applied to Catherine of Siena, Rose of Lima, Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Lisieux, she would not have made it past servant of God. On the other hand, if the same process that ostensibly canonized her were applied to countless other women in the past who didn't make the cut, those women would have reason to be irked because they would have been canonized. People were not, did not proceed past servant of God, the first step in the process, who were far more meritorious of being canonized. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Why, why have they not taken these new, the, the lower bar and gone, back, it. gone backwards in history to apply Curve it? the test. Curve the test. Simple. In my estimation, because they don't fit the narrative. Faustina is the darling of the modernist ideal. More about that in a minute. Yeah, um, you, you would think the church would be eager if this new test, the, the lower requirements for canonization, she would be eager to go back and identify all of those. And rectify these, these apparent mistakes from the past. Right, these would have been mistakes by the hierarchy, by men in the church 
that failed to recognize that the the exemplary sanctity of these women in the past, because the standard was too high, you would think the church would be eager to go back and retroactively say, hey, we made a mistake. That person really is a saint. She needs to be exalted. Why have they not done that if, uh, if the new standard is the right standard? Good question. All right. So th this raises a question. Can't, isn't part of being Catholic relying on uh, the trust in the papacy as it regards the canonization process. I mean, it's, it's, it's deeply troubling to imagine that a Pope could tell us presumably infallibly that someone is in heaven, but what if they weren't? That, I mean, that's a real problem. It, it is a real problem. And I'm not sure what, what the way out is. Um, I know this, the process was originally developed to provide a very high, uh, it gave us reason to believe thoroughly that someone canonized by Holy Church merited canonization. And every step was taken to give us moral certitude that this judgment was correct. Everything that's ever been written about the quote unquote infallibility of the canonization process was written before it was dumbed down. And it has been dumbed down remarkably. It's making putative saints out of candidates that never would have passed muster in the past. And so we do well to question it. And we do well to doubt the sainthood of very many of the people supposedly canonized recently. You know, we, we could do an entire episode on the canonization process and everything that's happened sh since uh, Vatican II. Uh, are you up for that? I'm down for that. Let's do that. Next show. <laughs> uh, along those lines, uh, JP2 canonized Faustina and, and went against the Holy Office in, in terms of rehabilitating what had been twice condemned. How do we, how do we explain that? Of course, we, we can't know with certainty, but in the same way, there, there, there are two things we can say. In the same way that Faustina, a lot of her motivation was to bring a saint to her order. There's no question John Paul II wanted a Polish saint. He was Polish, so was she. He was obviously very proud of his Polish heritage, and there's no question he wanted a Polish saint. But probably even more important than that, the, the, the troubling theology of the entire phenomenon squares exactly with his theology as articulated first and foremost in the encyclical he wrote called Divesi Misericordia. It's all about God's mercy. The gravity of sin is completely disregarded as is the need for repentance and penance and the need to satisfy the divine justice. This is exactly the, the problem set that we have with John Paul's theology, the theology of the divine mercy phenomenon, and frankly, the theology of the new mass. These things are inherently modernist. All right, so we've been taking a very systematic approach through each of the components, her, her diary and, and the painting and, and, uh, and, and, and the canonization process. Let's put all that aside for a second. What most- Yeah, Jeff, we're putting a lot of stuff aside. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but, but most people uh, there that are involved in this devotion, they are attached to the, the chaplet, the, the, the short series of prayers that, that they say that they're very fond of. And, and frankly, I've, I've read these, these prayers. I've, I've said these prayers, they do not, on the surface strike me as, as by themselves problematic. Again, we've set everything else aside, all right? We'll suspend judgment for that. By themselves, <clears throat> the, the <laughs> one of the problems with it is it's the chaplet. There are countless chaplets. The Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary is a chaplet. There's a chaplet of the Holy Ghost. There's a chaplet of St. Anthony. There's the chaplet. <laughs> it's like it's the only one. Um, as a devotion, as a prayer, it's not a problem per se. 
That doesn't mean it doesn't have problems associated with it. It bears an uncanny resemblance to the chaplet of the Holy Wounds, which chaplet predates the chaplet of the Divine Mercy. But the chaplet of the Holy Wounds very clearly emphasizes the passion of our Lord. Uh, many people reasonably argue that the DM chaplet was simply plagiarized, maybe not by sister, but maybe by her confessor. But the real problem with the DM chaplet, and I've seen this often enough in my life, is that it is often just chosen as a quick and easy substitute for the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yeah, that is definitely true, right? The rosary takes basically 20 minutes and the, the chaplet takes 10 minutes. And, and I know for a fact that there are lots of places where the, the chaplet has been substituted for the rosary for that very purpose. That's, that's my observation. I, I don't see a lot of evidence of, and, and maybe it's happening, but I don't see a lot of evidence of people who faithfully pray the rosary every day who have also added this chaplet as some sort of an additional devotion that would merit more graces and, and pray for more, uh, you know, greater intercession. Have you, do you know, I mean, this is anecdotal, but. It is anecdotal. I, 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 I will say, I do know some folks very close to me who are very devoted to the rosary, have made the rosary their lives, who say 15 decades of the rosary a day and have done that essentially forever. And occasionally we'll throw in the chaplet of divine mercy. So, yeah. Well, but I know a lot of folks for whom it's an either or deal. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of the things that the reason we're talking about it today is, uh, and the reason it's, it's of such great interest is because we, we just celebrated low Sunday. Uh, that's not what some folks were expecting. No, no, it's not. So a, a lovely, a lovely, lovely woman, a newcomer came into our chapel last Sunday and I, I greeted her. And she said, I'm so happy. I'm just so happy. It's Divine Mercy Sunday. And I gently observed that within the traditional community, we referred to the day according to its traditional name of Low Sunday. I didn't bother explaining uh, Dominican Albis or White Sunday or, or Quasimodo. Or I just said, you know, around here we call it Low Sunday. She was, she was crestfallen. She was crestfallen. I felt terrible for it, to be very honest. You know, Low Sunday, in the ranking of feasts, it's, it's, it's actually considered part of the ranking of Easter. It's the octave day of Easter. And so it's called, well, the precise reason why it's called Low Sunday is not entirely understood, but some of the speculation says that it's just to distinguish it from the highest Sunday of the year, that would be Easter. And so this is like, and it is, it is often referred to as second Easter because it is the octave day of Easter. This is a big deal. According to constant liturgical practice, no feast was ever supposed to replace it. And this was explicit. It was forbidden to substitute any feast, regardless what date Low Sunday fell on. We certainly live in a time of hyper papalism, right? There's there Vatican I had its own fallout, right? Where despite what the church taught about the limits of the papacy, somehow it's been followed by a century of, of uh, extreme ultramontanism. What would you say to the people who say, well, Pope can do whatever he wants, you know, he can bind and loose? There is, there is no authority that is not in some way constrained. Even God's authority is constrained. So no leader has the authority to do as he darn well pleases. Everything that the Pope does must be for the manifest good of the faithful and must be in conformance with tradition and all the doctor, doctrinal pronouncements of the church that preceded him. The, the, the Pope is first and foremost <laughs> a, a custodian of tradition. 
<laughs> yeah, he's, 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 I mean, Vatican I refers to him, uh, uh, those kinds of words, custodian, protector, defender. I mean, he's, his. That's, that's the great irony of this document that, uh, that Pope Francis just came out with. It starts out, Tradiciones Custodes, the, custi the custodians of tradition, the preservers of tradition, spare me. There's another aspect uh, to this that we've not touched on uh, yet, and that is the Divine Mercy Novena. This, I got to admit, this has troubled me because... It's over the top. My, my, my social media accounts were just bombarded on Good Friday. Of all days. Yeah, I mean, it just seems totally out of place. The, the Divine Mercy Novena would start on Good Friday and completely interrupts the, the liturgical experience which the church has crafted over two millennia now for our good to prepare us for Sunday. I, I guess I'm probably getting ahead of myself. And well, no, 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 you're exactly right. And the day when we should be focused entirely on the price of God's justice and therefore the need for repentance, we're supposed to now participate in a devotion that is entirely focused on God's mercy with no reference to his justice, without the cross, without repentance. And we completely disregard the price that Jesus Christ paid to earn that Father's mercy on our behalf on the day on which we most solemnly should commemorate that. And then for the entire octave of Easter. So starting Good Friday and then through up to the day, the Saturday before Low Sunday, in a novena, we disregard the celebration of our Lord's victory over death. And again, focus on a devotion that finds that death and our repentance superfluous. No, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, there does seem to be some sort of a pattern here, a, a, a pattern that's, yeah. it's, it's at odds with, with tradition. You know, it's, there's this beauty of it reminds me a little bit of the Luminous Mysteries in, a, in respect. That's another you know, show. <laughs> you know, we, I, I think we alluded to this before, but, you know, okay, you want to meditate on aspects of Jesus' life. That's, that's, that's fine. That's good. But there are higher goods in, in, the, in the church. And we have this beautiful, symmetrical piece of our liturgical life that just fits with everything. And, and all of this new stuff, it, it kind of doesn't fit it's like that that wheel on the shopping cart at the grocery store that just <laughs> it just re, you know it refuses to cooperate <laughs> what, what jim jim why do i always get that shopping cart you know <laughs> is God, i don't I'll, I'll admit i don't go to the grocery store very often but when i do when you do <laughs> it's always mine and it's just that one that's spitting and it's it, anyway that that's the feeling that i have about that's this your life it's, as a catholic too jeff <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it just, it doesn't fit. There's, it seems to be, you know, like with the Luminous Mysteries, people who are, who are devotees of that, it's like, that's, that's what they want to pray. It's like the other stuff isn't good enough. They don't want to talk about it. Oh, you don't pray the, the Luminous. There's kind of a judgment going on. The, the traditional piety is, is overshadowed. And, and that's the same thing with the divine mercy. I'm, I'm all for divine mercy. I pray, I pray for divine mercy every day, but but it, it just seems to overshadow everything that's been a part of our faith, all the traditional stuff. Sure. I mean, look, the, the list, God's justice, God's justice is overshadowed by his mercy. The need for repentance is overshadowed. Devotion to the sacred heart and the image of the sacred heart, overshadowed. Devotion to the Holy Rosary, overshadowed. Fatima, which took place seven years before, overshadowed the sacred triduum overshadowed the easter octave <clears throat> overshadowed low sunday overshadowed and for what reason and for what reason uh, fair enough you've observed that there is a fair amount of fanatical attachment to this devotion I, that's been my experience too um this episode is likely to ruffle some feathers, I think, probably. Um, what are you hoping to accomplish with this? We've spent more time on this than we have most, most any topics. Other subject. Well, 
honestly, I, I don't, I don't hold out much hope that we're going to dissuade the, the true believers. And, and I agree. I, I suspect we'll, we'll irk some folks. The weirdest thing about the whole phenomenon is how fiercely loyal its adherents are and how strongly they cling to it in the face of, of very serious and legitimate criticisms. And then how they, how they rationalize it and make excuses for it and apologize for it. No one ever had to apologize for the devotion to the Sacred Heart. No one has ever had to apologize for the devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. The, the, the statue that, that came from Fatima, no one has ever said, well, that, that's problematic. So mm, there are a lot of folks who are not going to be persuaded. They're not going to be dissuaded. On the other hand, I do think that those who are maybe um, not yet among the true believers, uh, maybe they're on the fence, maybe they're undecided. I think that we've given them enough information to know that they should stay away from it and cast their lot entirely with, with Fatima, with the rosary, with the sacred heart, the image and the devotion, and the traditional liturgy and all that it stands for, for the triduum, and for the octave of Easter. That's what I hope. Jim, I wanna thank you as always for uh, all of your time, your generous time today and, and all of the research that I, I put, that I know you put into this. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, so let's wrap up this episode. Uh, great work as always. Next Thank episode, you kindly. Folks, you've just heard it. Next episode, we're going to talk about what traditional Catholics should believe, how we should approach the phenomenon of the last 50 years regarding uh, what has come to be known as the Saint Factory, the, the prodigious number of new saints that are uh, declared by uh, the Holy Father since Vatican II. And, and what's happened to the canonization process? We touched on that a little bit today. It's kind of an extraordinary thing to think about. Uh, we're gonna jump into that on the next episode. Jim, thanks again for being with us. My pleasure, Jeff. Thank you and God bless you. All right, everyone. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. If you enjoy these conversations, please uh, like and follow us here on YouTube. Share this with your, your friends so that they can, uh, they can learn as well. And if you have questions or criticisms, we, we like to see that actually. So please be charitable. Don't hurt our feelings. Post those uh, in the comments below or wherever you've seen this, and we will include uh, responses to those in the future. Have a great day.